Okay, so here we are again, and this time we're talking about section 10.4, Moments of Inertia for Composite Areas. Again, kind of like we did with centroids and centers of gravity, when we have composite areas, areas made up of simple shapes, uh, we can use those shapes to avoid some of the math. And at the end of the section, you should be able to determine that mom those moments of inertia. Recall from last time, we talked about the moments of inertia for areas, and by definition, that's the integral over an area of a distance squared times a differential of area. And that gives us a moment of inertia with units of length to the fourth. And we also talked about the parallel axis theorem, where you have the moment of inertia about the centroid, and you want to find the moment of inertia about another axis, you multiply that by the area times the distance squared. And we talked about shapes, you know, having the maximum area as far away from the centroid as you can get to give you that maximum stiffness. So a couple things here, a couple little quiz questions. So we have this area A. We know the centroid location. It's at C. We know the area. We know those distances between the axes. About which axis will the moment of inertia be the smallest number? Make your guess. OK. So our moment of inertia is, by definition, the integral over the area of y squared dA. Well, no matter which axes we pick, the dA's are going to be the same, but the y squareds are going to be different, and because it's y squared, the further we get from the centroid, the bigger this number becomes. You know, if I had a number way down here, if I picked a point way down here, my y squareds are going to be huge, right? So our minimum is right there when we're at the centroid, because that minimizes the distance on average to all the points in that area. So the moment of inertia is smallest at axis 3. Our answer is Charlie. Familiar looking picture, but for this area we know the centroid's location, we know the area again, we know the distances again, and we know the moment of inertia about axis 1. We can determine the moment of inertia about axis 2 by applying the parallel axis theorem, and we have a number of options. I'll let you read those. Make your guess. OK. So the parallel axis theorem, we'll call that I prime, equals the moment of inertia about the centroid plus the area, which we know, times the distance squared between the centroid and that axis. Now, if we tried to apply it directly to, you know, we know the distance between axis 1 and 2, we know the area, but we, and we know the moment of inertia here, but we can't use that because we need to use the moment of inertia about the centroid, right? So what I, if this is known, and this is unknown, and this is known, and that's known, I can use a parallel axis theorem to find the moment of inertia about the centroid. And then once I know the moment of inertia about the centroid, I can apply it to find the moment of inertia about any point. So my answer is bravo between axes 1 and 3 to get us up to the centroid, and then we switch what is known and unknown, and we go from 3 to 2. Did you get it right? Let's move on. So when we talked about bending strength of an I-beam, you know, we talked about how having extra material out at the furthest distance from the centroid made it the stiffest. Uh, again, you know, I wouldn't want to have to come up with equations for that shape and integrate it. So just like centroids and other things, we can look at it and say, well, it's made up of smaller, simpler elements. You know, we have something with rectangular cross-sections here, here, 
here and here, and we have the dimensions. And that's very common out in the real world because depending on what you're building, that's there are easy shapes to make. They're fairly efficient for structural purposes, use of material weight. So we run into this stuff a lot. And if you recall, you know, our composite bodies are made by adding and subtracting simple shapes. You know, here we have we have a triangle, we have a rectangle, and then we have another empty rectangle that we subtract out. And we did looked at this before to determine centroids by doing the sum of the centroid locations of each composite piece and times the area divided by the sum of the areas. And for the holes we subtracted and for the solid areas we added. Same logic process. And you know the for simple shapes, the moment of inertia about the centroid axes is found in handbooks and in the back cover of the textbook, which again I will remind you if you're using a e textbook or something when it comes to the exams, it just have it printed out on on paper. I know it sounds like a crazy idea, you know, printing on paper. Oh my gosh. Uh, but if you have that printed on paper sitting next to you, all you have to do is glance over and there it is. You don't have to go searching for it and you just save yourself time, save yourself effort. You're more likely to notice it sitting there off to your side and you're more likely to use it and you're more likely to get a better grade on the exam. And if you don't have that inside textbook cover for some reason, remember I have uploaded it to Canvas. It's in Module 1 for Lecture 1. But given the moment of inertia about centroid axes, we can then use the parallel axis theorem and add everything up. So let's run an example. So we're given all the dimensions for the cross-sectional areas in this beam. We want to find the moment of inertia about the y-axis. So that's the moment of inertia about this axis and the radius of gyration ky. So that's the distance that if we had concentrated all the area at one distance from that axis, that would be ky. Okay. So our process is much like we did in the past when we looked at uh, composite bodies. We divide it up into simpler shapes. So I have the rectangle on top. I have two of these rectangles here. I locate the centroids of each simple shape. Okay, and that in this case is pretty, pretty trivial. And we identify perpendic perpendicular distance from each centroid to the y-axis. So for this shape, it's right there. For number two here. You know, the y-axis was somewhere here, and we can find this distance. Number three, the y-axis is over here. We find this distance. Obviously, we're going to look up the moments of inertia for each of those in a table, or in the charts in the back of the book. And we're going to do what? Yeah, we're going to create a table. Might be convenient, is convenient. Let me fix this for you, okay? <laughs> Especially, you know, this one's not so bad, but but if we had a more complicated shape, you definitely want to create the table to keep the math clear, okay? So you don't get confused and divide and conquer, you know? Break it into small chunks. So we've got three shapes. We've got the horizontal shape on the top. We've got the vertical shape to the left and the vertical shape to the right. We can find the areas for each one. So the top one is two inches by six inches and the bottom ones are one inch by four inches. So two times six is twelve. Last time I checked the others are four square inches. The distance from the y-axis, well, the top one was right on the center, so the centroid, centroid of that area is zero inches from the y-axis. The others were 1.5. And you can go back and look if you don't believe me. The moment of inertia about the centroid for a rectangle, and this is the base, 
the moment of inertia about the centroid itself. The moment of inertia for that rectangle is 1 12th base times the height cubed. And that's, again, about this axis. So the moment of inertia for our horizontal thing will be, we're looking about, we want the moment of inertia about this axis right here. So this is my base and this is my height. The base, well, let's go back and look. So the base is 2 inches. The height is 6. So 1 12th times 2 times 6 cubed should be 36. And for the others, I get a moment, or in this case, our, so we're looking about this direction. So this is our height across the short way and our base along that one. And when I run the numbers, I get 1 third. They're both the same. Now we need the moment of inertia about the y-axis. So again, we'll apply our parallel axis theorem, which, which tells us that the i, we'll call that about the y-axis, is equal to the moment of inertia about the centroid plus the area times the distance squared. So for the top row, we have the moment of inertia about the centroid. We have an area. We have a distance squared. of Well, that's 0, so this is just 36. We don't have to move that over. For this rectangle here, actually, that's a minus 5. One's on one side and the other's on the other. So we have moment of inertia about the centroid of 1 third. We have an area of 4, a distance squared of negative 1.5. But when I square that, that comes out positive anyhow. And that comes out to be 9.33. Same number here. The fact that it's on the other side is irrelevant because I square that distance. I can add up the areas. I get 20. We can use that later for the radius of gyration. And I add up the moments of inertia. And I come up with 54.7 inches to the fourth. So the three things that you needed for this problem was the numbers from the back of the book for that, actually two things. The numbers for the back of the book, or the equation from the back of the book for the moment of inertia about the centroid, and the parallel axis theorem, which is on, which is printed on the inside front cover of the book. Okay, so all this is given to you on an exam, and write out your table, and the radius of gyration. Our definition: it is the moment of inertia about some axis divided by the area. Take the square root. So our moment of inertia was 54.7. Our total area that we added up on our table was 20. Take the square root of that. And for the average value of 20, I get 1.65 inches. This is inches to the fourth. We've got to be careful with units. This is inches squared. That leaves me inches squared. Square root of squared is inches. Yes. Let's walk through our steps. If we're given this shape right here with uh, a big rectangle with a hole in it, we divide it into simpler parts. So we have a rectangle and we have a hole that we're going to end up subtracting out. Locate the, locate the centroid of each part and indicate the perpendicular distance from each centroid to the desired reference axis. So we know where the centroids are, and if this is our axis here, we know this distance here. Same in both cases. Determine the moment of inertia of each simpler shaped part, you, and then use the parallel. This comes from the table. Then you use the parallel axis theorem, 
And because it's a whole, we subtract it. So again, table, parallel axis theorem, and that will either be plus or minus. And then we add them up as the sum of the individual ones we found in step three. Again, a table. Unless something like this is simple enough, you could just rattle it out with two parts. But the more complex it gets, the easier it is to do in a table. Let's run another example. So we have the shaded area in this figure. We want to find the moment of inertia about the x-axis right here and the radius of gyration, which will be some, some distance ky. Our shapes, well, I'm seeing a big rectangle. I'm seeing a triangle that I'm going to subtract, and I'm seeing a circle that I'm going to subtract. So let's create our table and look up our stuff from the tables. So I have a rectangle, I have a triangle I'm going to subtract, I have a circle I'm going to subtract. The area of the rectangle, it is 6 inches across by 10 inches down. So that gives me 60 square inches. Triangle 1 half base times the height. So it's 1 half 3 times 6. And that is an area of 9 square inches, but I'm subtracting, so I'm going to put a minus 9. And from our circle, pi r squared, I get minus 12.57. Well, we'll call it 12.6. No need to get carried away with decimal points. And I'll add these up to get 38.4 as my total area. Distance from the x-axis. While the centroid of this 10 inch tall rectangle is going to be at 5 inches. The triangle is at one third of the distance from the top, from the taller edge, so that's 2 inches is the one third and the top is at 10, so we end up at 8 inches. The circle is 4 inches up. Moment of inertia about the centroid from our tables for the rectangle. 1 12th base times the height cubed. So we're, we're looking for the moment of inertia about this axis. So this is our base and this is our height. That comes out to 500. For our triangle, 1 36th, 1 over 36 base times the height cubed, 18. And again, these are about the centroid. And for our circle, I get 12.6 from 1 quarter pi r to the fourth. For my moment of inertia about the x-axis, I apply the parallel axis theorem again. Right, so it's i x equals i centroid plus the area times the distance squared. We've got all those terms. We have inertia about the centroid, we got the distance, we got the area. It's a plug and chug. This comes out to 2000. This, because we're subtracting, minus 558. And we, used, we could use the negative area. And 188.5 minus Add those all up, and I get 1,253.5. And the units there are inches to the fourth. The radius of gyration is our moment of inertia, which we said was 1,253.5, divided by the area of 38.4, which is the area of the rectangle, minus the areas of the empty spaces, and I get 5.71. So if we had concentrated all the area in one thin strip, it would be 5.71 inches from that axis. And of course, that equation is at in the, on the inside front cover of the book as well. So you probably want to have that for an exam. One final example, and we'll wrap this up. 
We have an I-beam as shown. We want the moment of inertia of the cross-section area with respect to the y-axis. So when we divide this up into rectangles, the height is going to run that way. Our base is that way. This is the base. This 50 millimeters here is the height, etc. It's a simple table, but let's just do it that way anyhow, because that makes our life much more simple. Okay, so we have a top piece is 50 millimeters by 200 millimeters. That gives me 10,000 millimeters squared, and the bottom is the same. For the middle section, I've got 300 millimeters times 50 millimeters, which I believe is 15,000 square millimeters. The distance between the centroid and the y-axis, well, for the top one, the centroid is there. The middle one, the centroid is there, and the centroid is there. So in all three cases, that distance is zero. Moment of inertia about the centroid, well, if I look in the back of the book, I get my moment of inertia about the centroid is 1 12th base times the height cubed. So looking at each one of these on the top one, now since I'm looking for the moment of inertia about the y-axis, this is the height in that direction, and the base is in that direction in our formula here. So this top one is 1 12th, base is 50, and my height is 200, and I cube that. For the middle, 1 12th, base is 300, and the height is 50 cubed, and the bottom one same as the top. Now I can apply the parallel axis theorem, IY equals IC plus the area times the distance squared. Well, in this case, the distance squared is equal to 0. So that makes our life simple. All we have to do is multiply these out. If I did that correctly, that is 3.33 times 10 to the seventh. 3.1 times 10 to the 6, 3.33 times 10 to the 7th. So even though this one, middle one, has a bigger area than the top and bottom, the moment of inertia is uh, smaller by a factor of 10 because it's it's you know laying flat. So you can see there's there's a huge difference even with less area these have a much higher moment of inertia than the center. And I add those all up, and I get about 6.95 times 10 to the seventh millimeters to the fourth. I could add the areas, but I don't really need to because I'm not finding the radius of gyration. And that is the end of this. I hope that all made sense to you. Obviously, if you have questions, we'll talk about that uh, in the next class. And I'll see you then. Bye.